we did it again. Verizon was just named America's most reliable network by Root Metrics for the 16th time in a row, proving once again that nobody builds networks like Verizon builds networks. That's why we're building 5G right. That's why there's only one best network, Verizon. Best and most reliable based on Root Metrics reports from second half 2013 to first half 2021 of three operators on all network types combined, not specific to 5G networks. Gym sessions and sweaty summer activities are back, which means more funky smells in your clothes because sweat leaves behind bacteria that causes those hard to remove odors. Clorox fabric sanitizer products are ready to zap the stink out of fabrics in your home by getting rid of 99.9% of odor causing bacteria. Eliminate odors in every load or sanitize fabrics between washes with one of our fabric sanitizer products. Search fabric sanitizer at Clorox.com to learn more. When it counts, trust Clorox. Use as directed. Impact of Influence, the tragic story of a powerful South Carolina family and the mysterious deaths that they are linked to. All right, welcome back, friends. Uh, Again, very surprised, amazed at the response. It's been overwhelmingly positive. We thank you for that, and we'd like you, if you could, to take the time. I know it's a little extra time, but to rate and share the podcast. My name is Matt Harris. She is Seton Tucker. And we take all the advice that you give us through Facebook comments and emails and reviews to heart. And we just try to get better and better every time that we do one of these pods. Uh, The Facebook page, which we have begun, is called Murdoch Podcast, M-U-R-D-A-U-G-H, Podcast. It's a Murdoch Podcast Facebook Uh, I started a new email because I'm getting lots of those, and I'll get to you guys, uh, respond to you quickly, as quick as I can. It's mattharrispodcast at gmail.com. Seton Tucker, it's spelled S-E-T-O-N, Tucker, on Facebook, or as we said, on the Murdoch Podcast Facebook page. All right, uh, we're going to do a whole episode about the Stephen Smith alleged hit and run, but people have been asking and questioning Seton about your interest in the case We know that it started with the fatal boat crash that killed Mallory Beach. It led you to Stephen Smith's case. Describe for us a little bit about your relationship with Stephen's mother, Sandy. Well, so I had just seen rumors online about a possible connection between her son's death and the Murdoch family. So I just felt called to just kind of send her this Facebook message. I've never done anything like this before. I was very scared. I sent her a message back in March of 2020 and just said, you know, I've seen these rumors. Is it true? And she, I said, I'm probably crazy for sending you this message. And she (laughs) said, no, I'm probably crazy too, which she's not crazy. But anyway, so she sent me um, a message back just saying that she did not believe that her death son was a vehicular accident in any way. And at this time, she was just kind of talking to anybody who would help her. She wanted to call attention to her son's case and get justice for Stephen. And it was prior to SLED reopening the case. And, you know, we just spoke a little bit about Stephen. And one of the things that I loved was he had a senior quote from Homer Simpson, which I'm a huge Simpsons fan. So I thought that that was super cool. Mm -hmm. So his quote was, you can have all the money in the world, but one thing you will never have is a dinosaur. Ah, I nice. just thought that was such a cool yeah. senior quote. I had something cheesy. I just copied other people. <laughs> so actually yesterday we were messaging back and forth about all the new information that came out about the Satterfield case. And I mean, she knows what it's like to not have answers or justice for her loved one. So she was just so excited that this is coming to light and that hopefully they're going to get justice. The Gloria Satterfield uh, kids who are now adults Looks like they're getting closer and closer to justice. Let's pray, and hopefully Stephen gets that same justice. Now that it's reopened, uh, after the murders of Paul and Maggie, it was reopened by SLED, so hopefully we're getting closer to that as well. And we will get to the Stephen Smith alleged hit and run, that story, plus we'll talk with a reporter who was the first one to talk to a South Carolina Highway Patrolman who was out there shouting from the rooftops that that was not a hit and run. Let's get to the actual Stephen Smith 
again, I'm going to say hit and run, alleged. Many people don't believe that. So let's set this up. Stephen is going to nursing school in Orangeburg. He's coming home from nursing school. The story goes he runs out of gas. They say that because they try the car, it is out of gas. The cap is out. Gas tank uh, lid is open. They find Stephen Smith's wallet in his car, which is weird if you're going to go find gas. They find him 2.7 miles. They find his body 2.7 miles from his yellow, they call it the banana car. And it's about three miles to where he lives with Sandy. Right. So he could have been walking in that direction. The early reports were saying he was walking for gas, but he could have been walking home. Right. Uh, then early in the morning, at what time? It was almost 4 a.m. 4 a.m., this 911 call comes in. Hampton County 911, where's your emergency? Hello, uh, I just going down the wrong Crockerville Road. Mm. I see somebody laying out. So what I find really interesting about this is how the caller describes him laying out in the middle of the road. So back in, right before Thanksgiving of 2015, that's the first Thanksgiving that the Smith family is having to celebrate without their son, Sandy Smith talks to the Augusta Chronicle, and she says, it doesn't make any sense. He was struck in the head by a truck mirror. I just can't see that happening. He would have gotten out of the way. It's nighttime. You have to assume that he's going to see lights coming down the road. So that would make sense. There is also a question uh, about him being harassed at one point due to the fact that he was gay. And this article that you're reading from November of 2015, they even reference a possible hate crime. Yes, in this article, she actually says several times that her son was killed for being gay by several local Hampton County youth from prestigious families, which she believes have sworn to protect their children no matter what heinous crime they committed. That's uh, very interesting as things have been playing out. And also, there was some report that uh, Stephen Smith told his twin sister that he was going to go deep sea fishing with someone. So in this article, it's quoted, one of the guys that supposedly did this, Stephen told his twin sister that he had a fling with the boy. He also told me that the boy had a deep sea fishing trip planned in July. Stephen died on July 8th. Um, Also, I want to point out that When the law enforcement folks showed up to Sandy Run Road to respond to that 911 call, they at first thought that Smith's wound was consistent with being shot, with a head wound consistent with being shot. Now, as things progressed, we find out that the South Carolina Highway Patrol really doubts the final final ruling that it was a hit and run, the final at the time, but it's been reopened. They really doubt that. And one of the people who was talking about this was Todd Proctor. And we have the reporter who had the chance to speak to Todd Proctor. And we will talk to him after a quick break. His name is Landon Stamper, and he's actually a friend of mine from college, son. He has graduated from the University of South Carolina with a degree in journalism, and he works for the Aiken Standard. Hi, Landon. How are you? Doing pretty good. Glad to be on with you guys. Glad to have you. So, Landon, how did you score the interview with uh, Officer Proctor? So, uh, at the office, we have a mutual connection, and his number had gotten passed along to me as someone who might be interested in talking about uh, his experience investigating the case. Uh, And so when I called him, he was open to it and basically laid out for me what had happened, what he had seen, just some of his general thoughts on the case. Can you kind of maybe give us a little bit of background about who Todd Proctor is for those who don't know? Sure. Yeah. So Todd Proctor was a, um, he was a former state trooper who, uh, worked with the Highway Patrol's multidisciplinary accident investigation team, otherwise known as MATE, M-A-I-T, which investigates complicated crashes and traffic fatalities. And so he had gotten um, called out originally to the scene because the the accident was originally thought to be a hit and run. So Highway Patrol had been called in. And so what did uh, Proctor and his investigation say what he found? 
basically what happened is when his team uh, originally got called out there because they thought it was a hit and run, and then authorities had examined a head wound that Smith had suffered. Um, so uh, Proctor had said that that's when his involvement ended and Hampton County had called SLED for assistance. But then when the pathologist who performed the autopsy determined that Smith had not been shot and had determined that Smith might have been struck by a car, Proctor's unit became involved again and kind of played catch up a little bit, collecting pictures and uh, evidence from the scene. I have to back up for a second. So okay. Proctor's, he uh, he's originally called out. Uh, and this is yes. soon after the 911 call and all this stuff. This is relatively soon after all that. Yes. Okay. So he's called out and they think that maybe Stephen Smith had been shot. Right. So, so well, so they okay, send him so away. Called, right. So yes, basically. Yes. <laughs> so, they, so they say, we've got this, this is now highway patrol, not mate because it's a shooting. It was, it was highway patrol was, just pushed out entirely, and sled was called. Oh, sled was because okay. They thought it was a shooting. Yes. Sorry. Okay. So sled was okay. That's okay. So what now? That what's the time frame when it changes over again? Do you know? He said uh, that it was a couple days later when I interviewed him. Okay. So he goes in now to see the pathologist, who has right. who has said it's a hit and run. Correct. He he is not happy with that ruling. Right. And so I have in front of me the, the report, case notes that he had made after he met with the pathologist. Um, and he says that so the pathologist named Dr. Aaron Presnell. He says that as soon as Dr. Presnell came into the room, she began in a negative tone stating that I didn't have a meeting scheduled and she was very busy. Um, and then I, the proctor asked her why in the report that she stated it was a hit and run. And her answer was that because he was found in the road and that was her only evidence for her saying that it was a hit and run. And which is, which is interesting. Right. And, and I, let me get this right again. This, so she is the pathologist, but now there was a coroner, coroner previous as it go, had ruled it was not a hit and run. Correct. The coroner, uh, the coroner did not agree with the pathologist. And the pathologist has the final. We did it again. Verizon was just named America's most reliable network by Root Metrics for the 16th time in a row, proving once again that nobody builds networks like Verizon builds networks. That's why we're building 5G right. That's why there's only one best network Verizon. Best and most reliable based on root metrics reports from second half 2013 to first half 2021 of three operators on all network types combined. Not specific to 5G networks. True crime on A&E with groundbreaking original shows like The First 48, Cold Case Files, Accused, Guilty or Innocent, and American Justice. No one brings you closer. Groundbreaking true crime every Thursday and Friday on A&E. Well, say I take it? Yes. Proctor had said to you that there was no evidence to support a hit and run. Correct. And why didn't he think there was any evidence to support that? Right. So when I interviewed him, he said that just looking at the initial pictures and evidence that was found, he said, you know, he'd been on highway patrol for 15 years and nothing about that case looked like a hit and run because investigators had noted that there was no vehicle debris or skid marks on the road. Smith had suffered blunt force trauma to his head but his loosely tied shoes remained on his feet according to records from that time. And so that just doesn't, to him, wasn't consistent with um, a hit and run. People be knocked out of their shoes. They were they're barely Correct. on. When would he give you this interview? You know when it was? It was June the 24th. Paul and Maggie are murdered, which makes him, I guess, think about this case again. Well, yes. And then after... When, when SLED was investigating the, the shootings of Paul and Maggie, they reopened the investigation or re basically reopened the investigation into Stephen Smith's death as a result of something that they found when they were looking into the deaths of Paul and Maggie, but they didn't say what it was that they found that caused them to relook into the case. Well, and reading back through, I was reading some of his report today, and it just seemed like 
he was he hit he's you say it in your article he hit a brick wall every direction he went right he said every once in a while a new lead would come in and we'd try to track it down and see if anything panned out and unfortunately we weren't able to solve it and he is no longer with uh highway patrol correct that's great man that's really yeah, good thank information you so much. Great. thank you so much yeah thank you guys we also have some audio from an interview Proctor gave to a local Fox affiliate. You stated then, uh, on record, that you thought it pointed towards a murder. Why? Uh, I mean, again, you know, as any investigator, you go off of the evidence. Um, there was no evidence that, that you know, pointed towards this being a hit and run or a vehicle even being involved in it. Um, it looked like it was more staged. Um, like possibly the body had been placed in the roadway. This is just so frustrating because it appears there's only one person, the pathologist at MUSC, who is all in on the hit and run. Let's touch on some other points, things that have been found out through either FOIA, uh, which is the Freedom of Information Act that TV stations and newspapers grab, like the Island Packet, and the uh, TV station in Charleston did a good job on it as well. Uh, what would you like to point out that we haven't hit yet on this? Okay, so we know that there was a rape kit done, a gunshot residue test, fingernail clippings. Uh, we also know the FBI took his phone um, to process. They also offered to process additional information, and this was declined. The other thing is... There is apparently missing evidence, which has kind of been a theme throughout many of these mm -hmm. cases, yep. the missing evidence. Now, Sandy doesn't know exactly what evidence is missing, but she suspects it could be the rape kit or the gun residue test or possibly the fingernail clippings, which to me, if, if I think when we saw information from the reports, there were defensive wounds on his arms. Right. So with defensive wounds, you could think that there would be some sort of DNA evidence possibly under his fingernails. And it's just so bizarre if it was a hit and run. They're doing a rape kit. They're doing fingernails. Uh, so that is so interesting to me. And there was also a problem with Stephen's phone. Explain that situation. It was, it was locked. The right, FBI I think took that's it. why the FBI took it to try to unlock it. Okay. And then we also want to comment on the bag of Stephen's clothes, which there could have been a chain of custody issue with. Yeah, it's definitely another thing, because back when Proctor then found out he was back involved, he was inquiring about the clothing, and Stephen's body had already been transferred to the funeral home, and he had to collect the clothing there. And one thing that came up from the clothing, this was reported by Banfield, where there's some tiny blue flecks of paint, very small, on his shirt. Ashley Banfield show at the blue paint was rumored to have come from a late model Toyota or a vehicle that you would go four wheeling with. Dune buggy uh, is mentioned, or one ATV. of those gators that people drive around on. Also of note, the deputy coroner, Kelly Green, who disagreed with the pathologist, she was saying it wasn't a hit and run. She was fired soon after the hit and run ruling happened. Don't know if it's related, but worth noting. And also, uh, we haven't mentioned yet that it's been said that Randy and Alec, who are brothers, showed up. Yes. So I found this odd, and as did Sandy, that they would show up. But it is noted that Alec worked as, as a volunteer prosecutor, so he could have been called in that capacity, and that's why he showed up. Also, that... He had some ties to this Stephen Smith. Because Buster and Stephen were involved in Little League together. Right, and they were classmates. classmates. So I think they knew. And also, um, Alec had represented Stephen's father in some right. other litigation. That's right. So Randy and Alec show up at the accident scene. And then also Randy, Alec's brother, is the second call to Stephen's house. At first the coroner, and then... It's Randy talking to Stephen's dad, who has since passed away, that he would represent Stephen and the Smith family and the lawsuits for free. 
Stephen's twin sister is quoted as saying she found that odd. Now, there's some FOIA stuff that was acquired by WCBD and by the Island Packet, uh, where they went through the investigation and the recordings of interviews. And one of the things that's pointed out is the connection and rumors with Buster Murdoch that come up through the course of the investigation. Uh, Case notes detail within a month of Smith's death, investigators have been receiving tips linking him to Buster, the son and brother of the two Murdoch shot dead in June. Here's a quote from one of those. We didn't know who did it, but we just heard that Buster did it, said one man to investigators. Everybody knows who Buster is and like his family and all that, so it's kind of shocking, he added. The investigators tried to trace back. I mean, this is a rumor. It's just a rumor. They've done nothing to make this stick. The investigators say they searched and searched to where the rumor began. Uh, they even asked in one point in the investigation, did he say where he heard that from or how he was backing that up? Well, Proctor says in one of his interviews that he was wanted to talk to the Murdoch family, but they kind of shut down and weren't willing to talk to them. And unless they have enough evidence to compel them, they... They don't have to speak. They don't have to speak. The Murdoch name came up again. This was a connection to a different alleged suspect. There was a, a tip that said they knew the identity of Smith's killer, and it was a drinking and driving hit and run. And the tipster said he was passing the information on because Randy Murdoch, Buster's uncle, told him to call. That then ended up not panning out in any way, shape, or form. So, I mean, I, th- I think this all goes back to Sandy's original quote back from 2015, where she says, everyone knows what happened to my son, but nobody wants to tell me who is responsible. Sad, sad. Well, it has been reopened, and hopefully SLED is getting to it again. A reminder that they're op- they opened it up again because of something they found in the course of the investigation into Paul and Maggie's murders. You can reach out to us on... Our new Facebook page, Murdoch Podcast, Murdoch Podcast on Facebook, and Seton Tucker on Facebook. And I have a new Gmail, Matt Harris Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, I do a morning show for WLNK, Matt and Ramona show. You can find me through there as well. And we want to point out that we are getting some information from people through Facebook and Gmail and whatnot. But we would also, uh, like to tell you that we are invested in this emotional. I have family in Charleston. Seton went to school in Beaufort County, in the low country. Uh, and we're working on, we're working with a documentary filmmaker who went to college at Charleston, uh, has a 17 year old gay son. So the Stephen Smith thing really struck a chord with him. So the story we believe through these people is going to be told truthfully and honestly and will make the area look good. Uh, We appreciate your time. We appreciate your listens. Contact us just to let us know if we're doing good or bad or if you want us to talk to you about what's been going on. We'll all talk soon. We did it again. Verizon was just named America's most reliable network by Root Metrics for the 16th time in a row, proving once again that nobody builds networks like Verizon builds networks. That's why we're building 5G right. That's why there's only one best network Verizon. Best and most reliable based on Root Metrics reports from second half 2013 to first half 2021 of three operators on all network types combined, not specific to 5G networks. Gym sessions and sweaty summer activities are back, which means more funky smells in your clothes because sweat leaves behind bacteria that causes those hard-to-remove odors. Clorox Fabric Sanitizer products are ready to zap the stink out of fabrics in your home by getting rid of 99.9% of odor-causing bacteria. Eliminate odors in every load or sanitize fabrics between washes with one of our Fabric Sanitizer products. Search Fabric Sanitizer at Clorox.com to learn more. When it counts, trust Clorox. Use as directed.